Well, I think maybe just to start with um, who I am and where I am. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Journalism, Film and Television at the University of Johannesburg. Um, I'm, I'm a UV at UJ because I just started at the beginning of July. And before that, I was at Rhodes University. And before that, um, I worked for many years for a non-governmental organization called the Freedom of Expression Institute. And I think it's the experiences that I had, particularly in that organization, that inspired this particular book. Um, it also brings together a, into a single narrative a number of articles that I've written, particularly since 2010, for the South African Civil Society Information Service, um, for which I'm a columnist, as well as for other platforms, the Man of Guardian and the Daily Maverick, for instance. Um, now, what, what, what exactly is the book about? Well, I think the best way to describe the content is to start with two recent events that I'm sure we're all very, very familiar with. The first recent event um, involved the EFF um, attempting to extract accountability from the President in Parliament for um, spending excesses on his um, presidential residence in Kandla. Um, and we saw um, quite an extraordinary response um, to their disruption of Parliament. Um, the security cl cluster ran down to Parliament in an attempt to try and address this apparent threat to national security, um, and um, it seemed like the uh, Ministry of Defence um, played a particularly leading role in that response. And I quite liked the, um, the, what Richard Poplack had to say about this particular response um, on the Daily Maverick, when he likened it to using, to heating a TV dinner with a rocket launcher. Um, it, it really did seem to be a, an excessive response in order to enforce a point of order. Yet on the other hand, um, a, a couple of weeks ago, and this has been a less well publicized issue, um, three shop stewards from the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, were killed in what appears to be um, an assassin assassinations. Um, and um, this isn't the first time that these kinds of political killings have taken place recently in South Africa. We've seen since, since 2009 um, a number of um, assassinations of whistleblowers in various parts of the country, starting with Kumalanga, um, spreading to the northwest with the killing of Mos Pakwe, um, and then um, moving to KwaZulu-Natal um, to the point where it seems like KwaZulu-Natal has practically, practically become the assassination capital of the country. Now the question that arises out of all of this is why is it that the security cluster moved with such incredible speed in order to protect um, you know, the president from criticism under the guise of protecting the integrity of parliament, yet on the other hand has moved with glacial slowness, if it's moved at all, on the question of these political assassinations. If you actually do an analysis of the national intelligence priorities, which are secret, but if you look at the public pronouncements um, around the national intelligence priorities and strategies of government, nowhere um, do these um, killings appear um, as, a, as, as, as a possible threat to national security. And I think what we can discern from all of this is that it, it appears like um, while there are elements um, of, of strong democratic control of the security cluster, um, there seems to be a drift towards the security cluster becoming a, a Praetorian guard um, for the political elite. And what this book examines is how and why that particular process is happening. Um, but what I also try and do in the book is often the, the, there's a tendency for the doings and the misdoings of the security cluster to be told on a top-down basis. So in other words, to look at um, the policy and legislative framework or to look at how the security cluster responded to the Kandla controversy or the doings or misdoings of Richard Ludi, for instance, in crime intelligence. I think that there's very little, been very little effort to systematically document um, the, um, the workings of the security cluster from a ground up perspective. In other words, from the experiences of political activists who are all too often change agents um, in many different communities. And I think um, in an attempt to try and systematically document um, the, um, the workings of the security cluster through the eyes um, of political activists in different parts of the country, it starts to become apparent 
that um, elements of what one could call a national security state um, have been under construction for some time now. Um, and it, to this extent, I actually take issue with an argument that Mondi Makanya has made recently, which is that the security cluster, um, elements of the security cluster are going bad because it's being used in order to shield um, the president um, from criticism and, and to keep him in power. Um, it's not that simple. Um, in fact, you can see elements of the, um, the securitization and militarization of the state reaching back um, to the late 90s, early 2000s, um, which is the time when um, neoliberal policies um, started to be not just introduced, but certainly intensified in South Africa. And again, what this tells us is that the architecture of a more authoritarian state um, is now quite extensive. Um, and has been rolled out um, for some time now. But what I also try and do as well in the book is to look at the international dimensions of all of this. There's a tendency towards South African exceptionalism when it comes to telling the story of the security cluster. And in fact, when you look at these developments in an international context, particularly since 9-11, and more particularly since the rise of the global recession, you start to realize that the kind of modalities of more authoritarian forms of social control um, have been rolled out in many other parts of the world. And in fact, many of the techniques of more oppressive forms of social control have been imported, sometimes wholesale, um, into um, elements of the South African security cluster. Um, militarized policing um, is an example of that, um, intelligence-led policing. You can trace the international pedigree um, of the kind of uh, surveillance policies and practices in South Africa back to um, uh, surveillance policies and practices um, in particularly the US and to a lesser extent um, the UK. But what's also interesting when you examine the phenomenon of securitization and militarization in South Africa, um, you start to realize that mm, a number of um, worst practices have been globalized um, and, and have been domesticated um, in South Africa. But many of the best practices um, have not been uh, globalized um, to a, a great extent. And this, it becomes particularly apparent in relation to the communication surveillance regime that we've got in South Africa, which I examine, where um, um, uh, an architecture of surveillance has been established um, without the concomitant um, 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 protections for basic human rights, particularly the right to privacy. Um, so the book is divided into four sections. The first section attempts to do a, a, a more dispassionate audit of the um, democratic content, but also the authoritarian content of the security cluster and how that's been shifting over time. And there I focus particularly on um, the state of the military, the intelligence services, and, um, and the police. The second section um, um, looks at um, the right to protest, the state of the right to protest, what's happening with the right to protest in different parts of the country and what this tells us about the quality of democracy um, in South Africa. And then the third section includes um, an analysis of press performance in relation to telling the story of the security cluster. And it incorporates a case study um, that I've done of the early press reporting of the Marikana massacre, which also within that incorporates a case study of the Mail Guardian and how the Mail Guardian newsroom um, responded um, to um, to, to the massacre in the very early days. Um, and it asks the question, do we have the kind of journalism that we need in order to deal with growing problems that we're seeing in the relationship of the security cluster to society? And then the third section deals with the securitization and militarization of electronic communications and the internet. And it looks at how the growing phenomenon internationally, particularly in the US, um, towards um, turning a new issue like um, um, possible threats um, to information security online into a national security concern, um, um, manifesting itself in um, uh, cybersecurity um, policies, um, 
and how this kind of um, approach towards um, militarizing and securitizing the internet is playing itself out in South Africa. And I also look at the communications surveillance set up in South Africa and I ask the question, um, what is the, 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 the democratic and authoritarian content in relation to um, um, communication surveillance. Um, and I think perhaps just looking at um, how securitization happens, there's an almost predictable cycle that South Africa appears to be um, 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 falling into. Um, which has been summarized quite nicely by um, someone who I quote, um, a UK academic um, called Mark Neocleus. Um, and he says, um, whatever example we use, the pattern is the same. An emergency occurs in which security is threatened. Existing emergency powers are exercised and new ones put into place. These are then gradually stretched beyond their original scope. The stretching is gradually justified and legitimized until the police and security forces are ex exercising the powers way beyond their original context to the extent that they become part of the everyday functioning of the rule of law. The emergency becomes permanent, the exceptional becomes the rule, and the sun, fail, and the sun fails to set on the sunset clauses. Um, and I, can, I think we can see this kind of uh, process of securitization taking place, particularly in relation to um, um, struggles against um, social inequality in the country, um, because I think a lot of the, um, the kind of securitization and militarization measures are being directed towards stabilizing um, social relations. We know that South Africa doesn't face um, any major threat to its national security, um, yet in spite of that, a number of the post-9-11 um, extraordinary security measures have been domesticated, I would say, um, to increasingly fight the enemy within. Um, so I think just also reflecting on where this all seems to be going, um, I think what is very clear from an analysis of the um, where the security cluster is at the moment, if, at this moment in our, our history, is that the basic democratic framework that governs the security cluster is still in, in, intact. So, um, you know, we mustn't fall victim to overstatement um, about the problems that we've been experiencing. Um, and also the constitutional framework is likely to check the worst excesses um, of the security cluster. But also, I think there's a number of processes unfolding in society um, that are driving the problems that we see. So I think the Zoom administration is caught in a number of contradictions, some of which are of its making, and some of which aren't. Um, I think, for instance, the recession has limited the scope for progressive maneuverability um, by the Zoom administration. Um, but I think also the policy choices in favour of a more externally orientated economy has also made South Africa vulnerable um, to economic shocks. We can see that the ANC is gradually losing electoral support. It's, it's slow, but it does seem to be happening. And given that BEE policies largely seem to have failed to redistribute wealth um, from white hands to black hands, the state um, is, has become increasingly important as a key site of accumulation. So um, if um, elements of the politi politically lose access to the state, um, they risk losing everything. But we can see this starting to happen incrementally, particularly at local government level. And I think these failures suggest that repression is likely to become a more enduring feature of the political landscape. But I think also, given the mounting costs of repression, I don't think that the state can afford to turn its guns on its own people um, in the way that we've seen in Marikana. And because of that, I think that Marikana is not likely to be repeated. Um, but I think what's likely to happen is that repression is likely to be driven underground, which implies two things. Firstly, we're likely to see that the intelligence services um, uh, may become much more politically contested than they are at the moment, because the benefit of using an intelligence-driven approach 
um, towards containing social conflict is that it's, it's less visible, given the high levels of secrecy around the intelligence services. I think the second thing that we may um, start seeing as well is um, what I'd refer to as a professionalization and industrialization of hit squads, an informalization of repression. Um, and particularly given the weakness of the National Prosecuting Authority in actually dealing with isolated problems that have happened in different parts of the country, this may increase. But I think on the upside, on the upside, I think there's unprecedented levels of political <coughs> diversity happening in the country. There's a reconfiguration of the political landscape, and the political space is to an extent wide open. Um, and I think no matter how difficult the current period may feel, the, the post-Marikana period, I actually think that the current period is, is, is pregnant with great promise. And I'll conclude the book by looking at the political tasks that need to be undertaken in relation to the security cluster. And there's a lot of them. There's a whole range of reforms that I think need to take place. Disentangling the intelligence, the police, um, and, and the military, because we actually see an increasing convergence of the three. In fact, um, there's a reference increasingly to the joint security forces, but this convergence isn't taking place along civilianized lines, but along more militarized and intelligence-led lines. So it's, it's separating out, um, clearly defining the powers and functions of the three, um, demilitarizing the police, um, but in a substantial way, and I make the argument in the book that the, 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 the whole demilitarization debate, I think, has been, has been presented very superficially. But I think an additional task as well that presents itself, particularly in those communities that are experiencing um, the sharp end um, of the security cluster sphere, is a return to many of the self-defense practices um, that we saw um, 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 years ago um, under apartheid. And this doesn't necessarily have to involve um, taking up arms, um, but it can, it can involve practices that many communities are actually engaged in at the moment. So arming themselves with information about how to defend their right to protest, for instance. That's happened um, in many parts of the country and it's been hugely successful, actually. But I think that um, um, self-defense practices and not just simply relying on a state-centric approach towards security is becoming an increasingly important response.